Okay. So, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Um, I'm starting to. All right, so hopefully my screen is visible to everybody. Can somebody just say yes to confirm? Yes, anybody? Can you hear me? Uh, yes, it's visible, sir. All right. So before we start the lecture, I want to go over some uh, preliminary um, stuff. Uh, the complete video of the first lecture is available, but actually I have um, split it up into small pieces and rearranged them and added a little bit of material. So it is better to go through the online course, which is available for free from the Al Nafi platform. And I have given a short link here. And all of the course materials, including a lot of additional material, is uh, uh, has been put on the platform. Uh, lecture one, for example, is on crisis in Islamic economics, which was not covered. Lecture two is the lecture we covered, but it has been split up into small parts and some material has been added. Uh, today's is lecture four, but there is some preliminary material which was distributed by email, which I will put onto the website uh, soon. So the best place to follow the course uh, is from the Al Nafi platform, in addition to the live lectures. And in particular, I'm especially interested in reaching, reaching teachers of Islamic economics, and I would, I would be happy to make special arrangements to have some live sessions with them. Uh, I'm already having some of these uh, because I would like to equip teachers of Islamic economics to teach this subject using this new approach, uh, which has no parallel currently anywhere. So there are some links on uh, where you can uh, join this. What I'm going to do is to sign out of WhatsApp. So if you can um, just send me an email or join my WhatsApp group for IML, which is uh, available from the about page on my blog, uh, then you can contact me and we can set up some special sessions to help you set up to teach this course, the same course on your own. So now we will start the lecture formally. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. So the title is How Capitalism Shapes Our Minds and Hearts. And this is the second lecture, live lecture, but the third uh, dead lecture on the course uh, outline. So before we start the lecture, I want to discuss a little bit about methodology. We are using a radically different methodology from that of conventional economics. So the methodology we are using can be called Ulum al-Umran. It follows the methodology of Ibn Khaldun, and we will be discussing this in greater detail later. But fundamentally, it's historical and qualitative as opposed to mathematical and quantitative. So um, in Europe, actually, this was also the methodology uh, before uh, the 1890s where um, a battle of methodologies took place and the old historical and qualitative methodology was replaced by the currently dominant quantitative and methodologic uh, quantitative and mathematical methodology and the reason the basic reason for this very briefly was that 
religious wars led to uh, rejection of religion as a basis for organizing society and social science emerged as an alternative. So the idea was that instead of religion, the new religion, which was science, was to be used to, uh, to study how societies should be built. But uh, this had some very harmful conse consequences. Science is the study of the external world. It is objective, factual knowledge about uh, things which everyone can observe. But my personal subjective experience is only known to myself. And this became regarded as no longer uh, knowledge. And uh, our internal experience is subjective. And this has been discarded by economists uh, who claim to be using the scientific method. So they use axioms, which are sort of scientific to define behavior instead of studying the human experience. But these axioms reflect rejection of God, afterlife, judgment. And so basically they say that axiomatically, we are all about maximization of pleasure. And also after you reject God, then humans are just another type of animal. And we are engaged in a cutthroat competition. And the only, only morality is survival of the fittest. So these are the, these are the um, underlying foundations of modern social science. So an alternative to this, which we are pursuing in this course is an Islamic methodology. So we reject axiomatics of human behavior and we study with a, start with an Islamic theory of behavior. And uh, fortunately for us, uh, great strides have been made in Islamic psychology. And one of the recent textbooks, which summarizes a lot of developments in this area is by Abdullah Rothman. And this is the model for uh, personality which has developed. Note how different this is from Homo economicus. So is the, there's the ruh which pushes us towards Allah and the nafs which pushes, pushes us towards the shaitan. And then the qalb and the aql, the mind and the heart serve as moderators and they can be influenced in either direction. So uh, we're not going to study that in great depth right now, but uh, it is the fundamental basis for all social science. So uh, since we have a, a superior theory of human behavior, we can build all of the social sciences on this foundation because all social sciences must ultimately come from uh, the study of human behavior. And since they have a very bad model in the West of human behavior, so they can't build a very satisfactory social science. So what is social science all about? Well, Ibn Khaldun set out to study the process of social change. And in social change, all dimensions come together, the political, the economic, the social, the educational, and the environmental. Uh, no, we cannot isolate any one dimension and study it separately. Now, when we study social change, there are three uh, possible methodologies. One is the modern methodology, which says human beings and society, they're all subject to laws. Human beings are just robots and we can, we are just uh, trying to find the laws of motion. So we're trying to discover the universal laws of motion, just like we can discover universal laws of motion for the planet, planets and galaxies. So this basically reduces humans to a robot. The Marxist methodology is better. It says that human lives are bound within economic relations of production and distributions. And these economic relations are subject to certain laws which we can discover by thinking about them. But Marxists also believe in material determinism, which means that our thoughts and our feelings and our spirituality are all conditioned by the material forces. So basically, um, our philosophies come from the environment. So um, the third uh, methodology, which is the Islamic methodology, which we are studying now, is that there is a two way influences. Material forces do shape our thoughts, feelings, and spirituality, but also our thoughts and feelings and spirituality shape the material world. And the primary illustration of this causal uh, sequence is that uh, the Bedouin in Arabs were ignorant and backward. And then a knowledge given to 
uh, given to them by Allah Ta'ala and demonstrated and uh, with accompanied by spiritual training given by the Prophet actually changed the course of history. So we see that man can also shape history, but also it is true and we don't reject that, that history also shapes man. So we will um, study both directions of this uh, influence in our course. So in the first course, we, in the first lecture, we studied about how we can change ourselves and how we can improve ourselves spiritually. And now we will study the forces which are, uh, the, the, that is an internal force which can shape us. There are also external forces which shape us and those are the uh, environment. So we'll study that in this term, uh, in this lecture. So basically the methodology for social change um, is depicted here briefly because it's very different from standard economic methodology and anybody who has studied economics will find it very strange and alien because uh, modern methodology is entirely different. Uh, first, we have some societies which are going along and then something happens, which we can say is an exogenous event, like, for example, the descent of the Quran. Or, but the exogenous event is outside human control, and this starts to create social change. When this event happens, then human beings respond. Different, uh, and, and this response has to be studied collectively in groups. So, for example, when the revelation came, there was a small group of believers who were trying to follow it. And then there was a large groups of unbelievers and they were trying to destroy the, the change. So th that's the response. Now, different uh, groups have different theories about these changes. So for example, the Muslims believed that this is a revelation from God and the non-believers believed that uh, the prophet is a magician and he's trying to control events for his personal be benefits. So there is a class struggle and uh, the, what the outcome has uh, occurs is a result of the struggle and the power of the other uh, different classes. But to, all together, these responses shape the course of history. So basically, unlike the first two methodologies, which go, give no real role to human beings, this methodology uh, puts human beings at the center and, and it acknowledges that we are, um, we are subject to historical events, but also it acknowledges the possibility that we can actually change history. So this is actually the natural methodology for social science, but it was abandoned by the West. Uh, prior to um, the modern uh, era, uh, the study of society was based on the Bible and is called the scholastics uh, approach. But there was a century of extremely destructive warfare between Protestants and Catholics. And that showed everybody that uh, society cannot be built on Christian foundations because it leads to perpetual wars. So um, Western intellectuals decided to reconstruct all of knowledge on the basis of observations and reason alone and abandoning uh, religion, and also at the same time abandoning all invisible factors and also abandoning the heart and the soul as a basis for knowledge. And uh, this is opposed to the Quranic uh, message which says that it is not the eyes which become blind, but the hearts. And it mentions in many different places how the heart is an instrument for cognition uh, heart uh, gives us knowledge and in particular the heart can be illuminated by the nur of knowledge by Allah Ta'ala. That is the basis for all knowledge. So there is a dramatic dis difference in uh, epistemology, what West considers knowledge and what the Islam teaches us as knowledge are very different. In fact, Islam teaches us that useful knowledge enters the heart. So with this basic Preliminaries, we start our on, on the topic of our um, lecture today. And we start with um, social change starting from very early era. So the hunter-gatherer societies were uh, based on very uh, basic living conditions. They, they used to gather the food and to hunt for food. And this would tendly, generally exhaust local supplies. And so 
we can see how this hunt, uh, the economic activity of hunter gatherer affected human thought so one of the things was that um, local supplies would become exhausted so you would tend to have nomadic societies because uh, you would have to move from place to place to both gather and hunt uh, a philosophy that is natural to uh, hunter gatherers is that uh, earth is our mother we take care of the environment and it takes care of us as opposed to this in recent urban life we have no connection to nature and so we are uh, less sensitive to the massive large scale destruction of nature that is going on because it doesn't seem to it, it doesn't directly seem to impact our lives the politics of uh, hunter gatherers is fairly egalitarian because each man can fend for himself and uh, subgroups can easily exit and find their own ways of living and generally speaking because you're living so close to subsistence there are no slaves which because um, any um, uh, each one must uh, basically produce enough to feed himself not enough to feed others which is what you need to have slaves also in a nomadic lifestyle there is no pro pro private property and so uh, the cherokee constitution of 1839 says that the lands of the cherokee nation shall remain common property basically you travel through the land and everybody should be allowed to benefit and you can hunt wherever you want and you don't want to have privatization some people claiming that you can't hunt in our land so that's uh, the primitive society but what are the trigger for social change well um one of them is cultivation of land and um, according to what i remember this was taught to uh, mankind via the prophets by allah taala himself so once we start cultivating land then nomadic lifestyle has to be abandoned and also private property has to emerge because uh, once you are cultivating a land you want to be able to harvest what you have put a lot of effort into so if if land is common property then once the fruit is on the land or the wheat then anybody else should be able to come and gather it and this is not uh, this will make it very difficult for people to put in a lot of time and effort into the farming so um at that point a division emerged in society those who were gatherers became farmers and those who were ha hunters became soldiers and they found out that as soldiers robbing farmers is easier than hunting so the farmers needed protection from these roaming soldiers and that basically led to the emergence of feudal society you have one uh, landlord and he has a group of soldiers and he provides protection to those people who are farming in the neighborhood uh, and uh, in in return for that uh, they get a tribute in form of the food that is produced so both sides uh, and this also leads to emergence of class structures the landlords and the soldiers acquire a higher status and the farmers have a lower status if you continue on this line and you get to city states which are uh, you get to st city states which are basically collections of um of uh, different feudal lords which uh, uh band together to provide prosperity because a feudal society with just the original structure is quite unstable because two or three uh, people can gang up and beat up one feudal lord and take it away from him so pretty soon they decide that they have to cooperate in the uh, society of uh, of uh, arabia which we have all studied in the pre islamic times there were khalif the different there were different tribes but they also made uh, alliances and uh, contracts with nearby tribes uh, for this purpose because no one on their own would be safe against uh, an alliance of uh, other tribes so um once you get to this 
alliance, then cities can emerge naturally uh, in within a safe area. And uh, once you have a city, then you have need of governance. And the cities also allow for much more economic power. And the economic uh, power allows for the maintenance of armies. And if you look at the history of Europe, this is basically uh, until the modern era, it's, it's, a, it's a lot of city states and there's continuous wars among different city states. And basically the politics of Machiavelli is the prince is describing how princes should go about acquiring power and winning wars and, and, and uh, governing their city. But ultimately, uh, even alliance, uh, even the city state proved unstable against an alliance of multiple cities. And that's what led to the, because that multiple cities had much more power. And that's what led to the emergence of the nation state. Now, when, uh, how did this nation state emerge? Uh, one of them is, uh, one of the uh, studies is by Benedict Anderson called Imagined Communities. And he says that the essential tool for the creation of the nation was the print media. Uh, you, you had these newspapers and magazines which were available to print cheaply. This led to a democratization of knowledge. Initially, only scholars used to read, but uh, with the print media, there was need to spread uh, and sell these things at large level. And so the uh, level of knowledge required for reading and writing became lower. And uh, when you started distributing uh, these newspapers on a wide scale, this created a common perspective and a sense of national identity. So uh, there was a strong effort to create national identity because uh, ultimately you, need the, you needed armies and you needed people to fight for and to live for and to die for the nation. So it was essential to create this common identity. And so there is this poem, lives there a man with the souls who dead, he hath never to himself said. Basically, this is trying to arouse people to feel uh, patriotism, to feel ready to die for their countries. And so basically, this is the modern version of the Asabiya of Ibn Khaldun. Uh, Ibn Khaldun remarked on the how you get groups to act on their uh, together. And basically at that time, the relationship was by clan and by kinfolk and by um, Kabila. Today, we, the, that's gone away, but the need for collective action is just as strong. And this collective action is created by a common identity. And one of the most common uh, identities is the national identity. And this national identity is created by the process of education. And so this is what shapes our hearts and minds because we are trained to believe in our nation and to, to be ready to live and die for it and to philosophize for the benefits of the nation. And there's this famous debate between Lama Iqbal and uh, Sayyid Hussain Ahmed Madini on the nation. And Iqbal says that uh, this nation is a newly minted god and the clothing it wears is the coffin of religion because if Iqbal is saying that allegiance to Adam salam must be superior to allegiance to nations and he saw clearly that national identity was the source of massive amounts of warfare and death in human history. It divides man against man and it, it, it uh, tells people to die for causes which are not and to kill their own brothers and sisters and regard them as aliens. And this is against the teachings of the Quran. As opposed to this, Hussain Ahmed Madani was in favor of using uh, nation uh, and national identity, not because he disagreed with Iqbal on the ultimate goal that all of human being is one, but he thought of it as a pragmatic strategy to win liberation against British rule. So ultimately it's, uh, it was a question of tactics, not of strategy. But this is a question which continues to divide Muslims. So, so while Halak has the most uh, uh, deepest study on this, the impossible state, he, uh, he argues that the nation um, is uh, antithetical to Islam. And um, also we know that the nations of the Middle East were 
created deliberately as a part of a divide and rule strategy. And it seems to be quite effective in the sense that the nations are continuously fighting each other. And this makes them weak and dependent on Western power, which is exactly what was planned. There is a nice book of history called A Peace to End All Peace. And that describes how this strategy was thought of and implemented to, uh, and a peace was created which would lead to continuous wars between uh, these uh, newly created nations so that the West would continue to play an important role in that era. So uh, I think the uh, work of Wael Halak is very important for us to read because this is a topic which is of greatly controversial. Uh, and there is a sequence of, uh, there's the book and a sequence of video lectures, which you can find on YouTube, which I encourage people to watch and to think about. But this is not our topic currently, so we just bypass it. Now, one advice to students is that when you are seeking to learn, then you must abandon all the emotions. And uh, see, presenting it, why they're saying, what they feel, and how they feel. Instead of uh, trying to assess, you read something and you say, oh, I agree with this. And you read another thing and you say, I don't agree with this. This is a great obstacle to learning. Put aside all pre-existing prejudices and bias and try to understand what the other person is saying. Emotions cloud understanding. Now, um, in other places, I have said exactly the opposite thing to this and I said we have to be passionate about our causes so this is actually referring to different stages at the student stage when you're trying to learn you should put away all emotion and all passion and all uh, pre-commitments and try to understand whatever is being said after you have uh, some amount of mastery of the field then you can make decisions on who is right and who is wrong but you should not try to do that too early and once you have an idea of what's right and, and what's wrong then you can support the right and uh, oppose the wrong. A larger lesson which we can draw from this history that we have gone through is that increasing levels of unity led to increasing strength. And the nation state, which is the most uh, big, biggest of these units, has been enormously harmful to human welfare and has led to continuous warfare. So Islamic ideals require unity at the level of ummah and also at the level of humankind. We are all brothers and sisters, sons and daughters of Adam and Habu alayhi salam. So uh, we need to work for unity at this higher level and we should learn to look beyond the nation state, although we must deal with it at the present time because they are so powerful, but we should be very cautious and we cannot use the nation state as a tool to implement Islam. Efforts to do this have uh, mostly failed across the globe. So now we come to our topic, the emergence of capitalism. And so um, in the feudal societies and in the emerging nation states, uh, some lines of thought that are important is that the uh, physiocrats thought that food and agriculture was most important. And that is certainly true in a basic society uh, food is what is needed to sustain the population, the working population, uh, which doesn't produce directly, and also the soldiers, which you need to protect the population. So you need to have a surplus in agriculture in order to sustain society. Otherwise, you will be at subsistence levels. Uh, once uh, the nation states got going, the theory became that of the mercantilists that you trade with other um, countries to acquire gold and basically the wealth of nations is represented by gold. And the reason for that was the primary importance of armies because armies were important to the maintenance of the city state and necessary for uh, warfare. And basically the way to acquire surplus was by wars, by taking over the countries of others but the industrial revolution changed this way of thinking and therefore also changed the economic theory. So the industrial revolution started with the agricultural revolution, which produced surplus food. 
And this was got going by the way of enclosures where the rich people uh, enclosed large tracts of land and prevented the peasants and the uh, poor people from access to this land. And this led to creation of poverty because prior to this, although peasants were poor, they didn't have much, but they were able to get uh, some sort of a living from the land. And they were also in social relationships. But when they were detached from their social and environment relationships, then they flocked to the cities in search of jobs and food. And this is, this is what disturbed the society. And this led to the awareness of, uh, of poverty. It also led to the creation of a labor force, people who had nothing and uh, were therefore willing to work for a small amount of money under miserable conditions. And this is what was needed to start off the Industrial Revolution. So there were a number of, um, number of inventions that created the, uh, the Industrial Revolution. But basically, uh, from, from our point of view, you have to think of Industrial Revolution as the creation of large machines, which required large labor forces to operate it. So uh, to operate them, uh, you could not be profitable on small scales like in cottage industry uh, in the industrial revolution. And so that's why a labor force was needed and many different. So this was the exogenous event, the industrial revolution. And this led to massive changes in society, in the political, the economic and the philosophical spheres, as we will see. This is the and main goal of this lecture to study the changes created by capitalism. So one of the consequences of industrial revolution was that there was a massive amount of surplus goods being produced far above and beyond the domestic demand or needs of the people. So this led to the creation of a market economy. A lot of surplus has to be marketed, so you had to start thinking like a consumer. Instead of basically in the pre-market economy, the goal of life was not to consume goods. It was you, know, you, you consumed your basic levels or even comforts, but the goal of life was something other than purchasing things in the marketplace. So the market play, uh, economy is actually very strongly opposed to the social economy. And the market economy has its own philosophy and culture and politics, which we will discuss. So the traditional economy, which is uh, aligned with Islamic ideals, um, uh, but uh, I'm talking now about the historical traditional economy. Uh, money was used only by the rich and uh, the poor had uh, very small amounts and it was not needed to live. Uh, basic needs were met by the social relationships, networks, um, not by the market. You didn't have to uh, go to, uh, to market to buy food. So market was peripheral to society. There used to be fairs to which people would go. And we see descriptions of these fairs also in the Arabian society, in the Jahiliya. So markets would, uh, yani markets which were uh, essential for existence uh, did not exist. But markets were useful to many people. And, um, but, but the basic process of living was taken care of by your network of social relationships. And because life depends on social networks, so um, character was very important. And in particular, placing social needs above individual was natural and was required for survival. You could not survive in isolation. And so within a society, generosity, cooperation, social responsibility, taking care of the weaker, and also uh, one of the things that is discussed by Polanyi in his great trans transformation is that markets were strongly regulated. They were not allowed to interfere with social life because there was awareness that markets can disrupt social life. You can't buy or sell friendships. So in England, after the industrial revolution, <clears throat> the markets acquired a lot of power and uh, one thing that uh, economists are very confused about is the fact that social mechanisms and market mechanisms are in opposition to each other. 
And one case where you can see this clearly is the blood donations example, which has been studied in the literature. So Solo and other leading economists thought that if we pay money to uh, people to get blood, this will increase the amount of blood that is donated. That's standard demand and supply. But in practice, the exact opposite um, uh, happened because when people were asked to donate blood, they were doing it as a social service uh, out of the feeling of helping fellow human beings. And this comes from our social mechanism. But when they were paid for this, then this uh, became a market activity and very few people want to sell their blood. Only some very, uh, it was a very different class of people who were selling their blood. And even if you add money that you can, okay, uh, well, what economists thought is that you can say that, okay, I'm doing this for a service and I'm also accepting money, but this doesn't uh, happen. You can't, um, I mean, these two in mechanisms interfere with each other. We do not sell our good deeds. We do it out of the, uh, for the sake of humanity. The best things of, in life cannot be purchased. And the Quranic message is that all the gold in the world cannot purchase even one moment of our life. Our lives are infinitely precious. So this is completely incompatible with the market society in which all human beings are for sale in the labor market. So uh, Polanyi's book, The Great Transformation, says that if you want to study the emergence of capitalism, you have to study two movements, uh, what he calls the double movement. One is the desire of markets to expand. And uh, this harms the market, uh, society. So society resists such expansion. So you have to look at both, how the markets are seeking to expand and how the society is seeking to protect itself from the expansion of the markets. So there are two questions which emerge. Why do markets seek to expand? And I won't answer this, but basically markets work by increasing profits and uh, Marx has a good analysis of why you need increasing profits. And so markets need to expand to basically survive. And markets are extremely harmful to natural society. And that is why society resists expansion. Uh, again, I won't uh, discuss this in detail, but it is available from Polanyi. So operation of markets requires three artificial com commodities. And again, this is taken from Polanyi, the great transformation. And these artificial commodities are land, labor, and money. So these commodities are artificial in the sense that they are not manufactured. They are not produced by uh, our uh, work. So as far as uh, land is concerned, this is the earth on which we live. We have a symbiotic relationship to it. We get uh, a lot of goods from this and in turn, we should protect it and nurture it. Uh, labor is the stuff which is made up, um, which our lives of, are made of. So uh, it should not be for sale at any price. And money is a social convention, which is created by agreement among ourselves. So it's not, it's not a manufactured commodity. It's, it's actually a token of trust. So when we start using land as, as a commodity, it cheapens the land. It reduces the value of land as a gift from God. Uh, and it, uh, uh, it, uh, we, we tend to forget about the miracle of land that it, take, uh, that it performs every day taking a seed and turning into a plant and food and many other materials of uh, great value for our lives. And similarly, Mother Earth has a lot of uh, uh, organic materials which we use to, from, uh, and for a vast range of products. So basically, the natural relationship is a symbiotic relationship where we think of the Earth as a trust a mana from God, and we take care of it, and we are in only in temporary possession of it, and we want to pass it on to the next owners in better condition than we received it. But when you think of it as a material for uh, sale and purchase, then it becomes a commodity for exploitation, and this change of spirit is the root cause of the current environmental crisis. 
when we start thinking of labor as a commodity, then uh, basically human lives are for purchase and sale. And this cheapens human beings and turns us into human resources. It also makes the value of money much more because money can now be used to buy human lives. Uh, labor markets first became possible because of the desperation created by the enclosures. The people were starving. And so they accepted uh, a very low wage in a, uh, in a market economy. Um, instead of, um, because they were unable to, uh, to use the land for uh, getting uh, a bare living. And then once this became widely accepted, then this became a social norm. And so today we, we all take it as natural that we are going to sell ourselves on the market to the highest bidder, but this is extremely unnatural. And this is one of the most important elements of how our minds and hearts are shaped by capitalism. We are taught to think of ourselves as a commodity for sale and purchase. Students are taught, taught to sell themselves in the job market. We don't realize that this is unnatural and um, artificial. And this is a creation of the market economy. This is not natural for us human beings. Finally, the third commodity is money. Uh, this becomes necessary in a market economy it, because markets are central to buying food. So um, you need money, so everybody needs money. And uh, labor markets also require strengthening the motivation to labor for money. Uh, money has two, two um, aspects. One is that it simplifies the complex exchanges that we need to run markets. Uh, so this is the famous barter theory of money. But there is a separate theory, which is the, that money is a creation of the government. And basically, if you have money debts uh, and money transactions, you are trading tokens for real goods. And you need to make sure that there is some power behind this so that the government um, rules and uh, regulations and support of money is a very important aspect of ensuring that uh, money, uh, that markets exist. Um, so the uh, money commodity is a complex uh, issue, which we will discuss separately later. But one thing that I would like to point out is that uh, because it's a common misconception that gold money is somehow best or optimal, this is not true. Actually, Commodity money is highly inefficient, uh, but if the, there's not sufficient government support and regulation, then uh, gold works uh, better than fiat money. So basically what um, we are studying is the process of social change. So when um, in a feudal society, the landlords are the most powerful people, sorry, not quite in feudal society, in the nation state, the landlords acquired land and their, their property was guaranteed by the state and land is the biggest source of wealth. Social responsibility for the rich. Uh, uh, for the poor was an essential philosophy for this class structure. Because um, basically uh, it was not an economy. And so the peasants uh, worked for the landlord and the landlord took care of their needs. So as the industrial society got going, the power shifted from the landlords to the uh, capitalists, to the industrialists. So some of the signs of this shift is the corn laws, uh, industrialization, um, as it was taking place, uh, it, you need food to feed your labor. So there were imports 
especially uh, from Europe in England, after the era of the Napoleonic Wars came to an end, it became possible to cheap, cheaply import corn from Europe. But at that time, the landlords were much more powerful and they uh, succeeded in getting cheap imports to be banned from England. But um, as the industrial classes gained power and uh, they wanted the cheap uh, corn to feed their laborers, they succeeded in getting these corns repealed. So in 1846, the corns were repealed. And this is just a sign of the rising strength of the industrial classes. Similarly, the poor laws were passed in 1795. These show the older ethos of the uh, pre-industrialist society where the wealthy feel responsibility for the poor. And so basically these laws guaranteed a living to all members of a uh, community. And uh, these were um, denominated in terms of amounts of bread. And uh, if people uh, were earning insufficient wages, they were supposed to be given enough money to be brought up to the minimum standard required. But this had an unexpected result that it um, killed the motivation to work slowly and gradually industrially productivity declined because people were able to earn a living for themselves and they, so they didn't need to work in uh, odious factory conditions. And uh, this led to a massive decline in productivity and um, um, lots of damage to the industrialists. And so they managed to get this these poor laws repeal. This had a catastrophic effect on the poor. A lot of them starved and, and lived in miserable conditions, but it had the result desired by the industrialists. It created a very docile labor market because it had been tamed by hunger. So one of the interesting insights of Polanyi is that economic theory was born in this period and it takes a conceptual framework which is uh, uh, which was created in that period. And uh, this conceptual framework is obsolete. Uh, one of the things that happened is that private property emerged as an absolute right. Prior to the industrial era, uh, the uh, property was uh, a responsibility, an amana, just like in Islam. In England also, uh, it has to be used with social responsibility. But um, in the England, uh, there were many wars for power. Different groups would take uh, control of the state and then they would appropriate the properties of those who had lost the war. So ultimately, the landlords said that somebody or the other is always fighting. Let's uh, make sure that our property is protected against whoever happens to be currently the sovereign. So they succeeded in getting, uh, <clears throat> creating a theory of property. Locke is one of the key names here, which would uh, ensure that property comes first before the state. So the right to property is absolute and is guaranteed against anybody. <clears throat> and there is no social responsibility. And so um, one of the key insights about capitalism is the that uh, the spirit of capitalism is the pursuit of wealth as an end in itself. You want to have more and more, not because, not because you want to enjoy this wealth for some other purpose, because, but because it is uh, desired for itself, because it gives you social status. So it's a sort of irrational in the sense that wealth is not uh, desired for its own sake, it's desired for the benefits it brings, but in capitalism, wealth is de desired for its own sake. So see, these are some of the attitudes that are created by capitalism because they are needed for capitalism to work. One of the key insights <clears throat> of Karl Marx into the nature of capitalism is that in a traditional society, money is used to get commodities. And so uh, basically we have commodities 
and sometimes we we trade we sell our commodities and we get money in order to buy some other commodities so basically the start point is commodity and the end point is more commodities or different commodities or better commodities but a monetary economy works in the opposite way the producers have money they use this money to produce commodities and to sell them to get more money so the profit motivation is there and a monetary economy the goal is to get more and more money uh now when you look at modern economic theory general equilibrium theory um and all of the 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 models of uh, the real economy etc these are very strongly based on the cmc prime framework the idea that we are um, individuals are motivated by consumption so more goods we have the more better off we are but the monetary economy does not work like that Uh, the producers wish to maximize profits because money is the goal that they have in mind and the consumer is also desire to maximize savings so they also want to get money because they want to protect themselves against um the possibility of losing jobs and many other types of adverse shocks so this uh, insight uh, the marxian the, of mcm prime is the basis for a monetary economy and it's not part of modern economics i mean it's uh, understood by heterodox by economists but it is not uh, understood by new classical economic theory so there are many false ideologies which are created by capitalism and which we end up absorbing one of them is the labor market human lives can be bought and sold for money so many students come to ask me that what line of education should i follow so that i can make the most amount of money so they think that the purpose of our lives and the purpose of knowledge is to enable them to make money and so another common conception is that the value of my life is the amount of money i can earn so if a person earns more money he is more valuable than a person who earns less money one of the lessons which came out of the um, early uh, industrial era is that helping the poor is harmful to productivity and ultimately to everyone because if the industrial production is harmed then no one gets the goods uh so it is understood that motivation to work is created by poverty so we need to cultivate indifference to poverty which is uh, against our natural instinct because if we really uh, work properly to wipe out poverty then no one will work and there will be no production and everybody will be poor so that is the one of the ideas which we are taught to believe and of course the rejection of christianity leads to the idea that the goal of life is to maximize pleasure power and profits without any concern for society and that pleasure comes from consumption of goods this is ne necessary in order to enable the production of more and more goods which capitalism requires and of course money is central to the working of capitalism so um we are trained to believe that if you want to pursue pleasure power and profits you have to maximize the amount of money that you have so goal of life becomes money for everyone in a capitalist society <clears throat> so how can we uh clear our minds and free ourselves from these myths of capitalism so there are a number of uh, things that we need to unlearn uh one of the central myths of capitalism is that the emergence of capitalism has been a great blessing it's the greatest success in the history of ma mankind the, basically the last 3 centuries have been massively successful and we have had so much progress and so on so the counter narrative is that emergence of capitalism has been a disaster for mankind and for the planet and this, this is what we need to understand and learn how this is Uh, and and the fact is that painting capitalism as a great success is necessary for the survival of capitalism because it's actually causing a great harm to a large number of lives and so uh, for example right now there are more than a billion poor poor on the planet when in fact there is enough resources to wipe out uh, hunger and all uh, take care of all basic needs health uh, health housing education and uh, uh food 
all of these things can be taken care of. There's enough resources on the planet to take care of everything, but capitalists keep saying that there is scarcity, we don't have enough, so we need to produce more wealth. And more wealth always goes into the coffers of the already extremely wealthy, it doesn't go to help the uh, poor. So how can we re uh, learn to look at the world from the opposite perspective that instead of being a tremendous success of the past three centuries, this has been a huge disaster. So, so one, one article which uh, explains this is referenced here. So um, when we look for solutions to the way that capitalism poisons our minds and hearts, uh, these solutions exist at the personal level, one by one individually, how can I free myself? And at the collective level, which we need for the ummah as a whole. Uh, so on the personal level, there are many tactics that I can use or you can use to unlearn the myths that we have learned. But on the collective level as a whole, uh, we need something else which is called, uh, which we need to produce an alternative to Western education which doesn't exist. And this is what I have called in other places the Ghazali project, uh, which you can look up in, on my website or blog. This course in Islamic economics which you are teaching is just one small piece of the massive effort which is required to replace the entire structure of the Western social sciences by an understanding of how we can shape societies according to Islamic laws. So what we are asking for is that uh, we need to replace social sciences which tell us how to pattern our societies by using fiqh uh, and applying it to the modern world. There are no easy solutions in the sense that we can't go and pick up the fiqhi solutions of the period of Imam Abu Hanifa because they were developed for a different society and different times. We have instead to do the harder job of looking at the usul al fiqh and looking at them to understand what we are, uh, situation we are in and devising solutions which are appropriate for the modern world. So this requires a lot of hard ijtihad. So, uh, to a uh, little bit more on the personal level, there are some slides on early, unlearning jahiliya and relearning Islam, which go through a lot of different uh, uh, issues that we need to unlearn and relearn. But uh, the primary is that our human lives are infinitely precious. Our success will be determined on the day of judgment. It doesn't matter how much money we have. Life on this earth is temporary, very short. So succeeding success or failure in this planet does not matter but uh, the test the success on the test depends on struggle if we struggle we make jihad for the good that is success not if we uh, achieve a successful outcome in this earth and wealth is not a sign of favor of allah and poverty is not a sign of the lack of favor or displeasure of allah so some of the, the, the basics that we need to learn on a personal level is uh, personal identity, which involves learning how to become a human being instead of being a human resource. Our education trains us to be a human resource. So we have to re-educate uh, ourselves and learn how to be human beings. And also if we want to overcome the traps, which um, the, the way our minds are shaped by history, then we have to learn the forces which have shaped our minds. One of these is the capitalism, which is the uh, third force on this list that, that we have been studying in this lecture. But there's also global colonization conquest which took place. Uh, and that has led to a shock and awe of the West, which, is, uh, which has paralyzed Muslim intellectual thought and made it very difficult for us to develop our own intellectual tradition on the basis of our own past. And also uh, European transition to secular thought has led to a marginalization of religion. We study everything in our education, but, uh, only, uh, but we don't understand and we don't study how religion affects these things because the secular society excluded religion. So now I'm uh, teaching this course as a way of showing how Islam affects economics. Because if you study the textbooks, you don't find anything. Uh, in fact, you, you get the opposite impression. You, 
you learn that religion is irrelevant to economics. And this is wrong, but to counter this, you need to step away from the secular uh, modern thought itself. So some basic antidotes, and we are coming to the end of this lecture, is that uh, econ modern economics is basically the economics of the nafs ammara. It says that you should take your nafs as your god and uh, do whatever it commands. And so it basically turns us into, a, uh, into an animal which is bound by his desires. Islam teaches us that the soul of human beings is a battleground for good and evil. And uh, the nafs is driving us towards the evil, but we also have a ruh which drives us towards the good. And uh, we can, um, and we, we should try to make spiritual progress. So modern economics is for the spiritually stunted, but Islamic economics is to make spiritual progress from nafs ammara, which we acknowledge, but we don't accept the commands. And so we go to nafs lavbama and to nafs mutmainna. And uh, this has a lot of impact on how we should think about economics. And uh, I think this is the last slide. So Islam also teaches us an attitude towards wealth, which is very um, powerful. Uh, wealth appears to be sweet, but it is not. Yeah, we should think of wealth as mata'ul dunya is ghurur. The, the material and comforts and pleasures of this life are just an illusion because they're only here for a very short time and they only have a very sweet appearance, but, 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 they're, but they're nothing in compared to the pledges Allah Ta'ala has for us in the Akhirah. So our attitude towards wealth is that we should be indifferent to it, but if our, uh, we are content and it is given to us uh, as a gift, this is a blessing of Allah and it can be used in many good ways. But if we are striving for wealth, if we have got greed in our hearts, then the wealth which comes to us as a result of this greed will not bring us satisfaction. And this is a very deep lesson, not available anywhere in the Western uh, philosophies. So I think we will end this lecture here with the dua. Allahumma anfa'ni bima allamtani fa'allimni ma yanfa'ni wa zidni ilma. Subhana rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifun. Wa salamu al mursaleen wa alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. All right, so now we can open the floor for questions. So you can raise hands and uh, ask, or there are lots of questions in the chat. I can try to have a look at that. So one of the questions that I see is the, yes, recording will be shared, um, inshallah. Um, economic history is a very important topic, but um, a lot of the hist economic history books are uh, basically justifying neoliberal capitalism, so they are not very good. I don't have specific recommendations in mind right now. As far as uh, gold as a common currency, etc., these are topics we will plan to cover in later lectures. They are too complex for a quick answer. All right, so let me ask Qazi Imaduddin for uh, his uh, question. Please unmute yourself. Assalamu alaikum. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Yes. Uh, Professor, I'm not sure if I'm uh, getting your point correctly. So uh, are you suggesting that uh, about private property, are you suggesting that Islam does not have any private property? Or are you saying that it's a mixture, we've got public property, but also private uh, property? Because yes, of course, I, we I have. That, hmm, hmm, okay, we yes, have a mix. Uh, we have a mixture. We have both public priority and private priority. But what I was, I was not talking about that. I was talking about absolute rights to private property, these emerged in capitalism. We have private property as am amana. It is given to us in trust. We don't have absolute rights. We can't burn down the trees and we can't uh, uh, cause damage to natural resources because we are owners and we are allowed to do whatever we want. So 
rights to our private property are limited to improving and making this private property of benefit to mankind. And in fact, our ownership is uh, contingent upon and is given to us on the basis that we will use the private property to make to, to, to make this private property beneficial to mankind. If we cause, if we use private property, if we don't use it, if we use it to cause harm, then this can be taken away from us. All right, somebody asked about the relationship of the, um, RBC model, real business cycle model. So this is again, um, the um, idea that we are living, uh, this is the CMC model, which I discussed. It's about that uh, economy is about providing commodities to people, but this is not how the economy works. The economy is about making money for people and that's uh, entirely different work. All right, so next uh, uh, question by Qazi Imaduddin. Oh, Henry came in. Henry Tanjung? Yes. Yes, yes Henry. You have a question? Yes, sir. All right. Sir. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So uh, very ask. interesting about uh, talking about methodology. You said that the historical and qualitative methodology derived from Ibn Khaldun is very interesting to me because uh, I've been uh, studying in statistics for four years in uh, yes. BAC and shapes my mind about quantitative. So how how we convince people that uh, qualitative is more powerful than quantitative? Yeah, I've dealt with that question at length in my uh, statistics course. But basically, you see, uh, the illusion is created that numbers are accurate measures uh, of uh, quality. And this is wrong. For example, Suppose I want to measure somebody's intelligence, then I can give him an IQ test and I get a number. This is 137. So what statistics tells us is that this 137 is the measure of his intelligence. But this is wrong. Intelligence is actually the qualitative thing which we cannot measure. 137 is just one indicator. So what is important and what is not important is reversed in statistics. In statistics, you say, OK, it's the number which matters. and um, uh, you should do analyze the number, but actually the truth is that it's the it's what we cannot measure, what is uh, hidden, what is qualitative, what is unobservable. That is what matters, and the numbers are just uh, imperfect indicators. So once you take this point of view, then you can redo statistics. Okay, sir. Thank you. All right, Zermal Abdullah. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, respected uh, professor, uh, thank you so much. I think you provided with enough information about the topic, but uh, my question is specifically about uh, the specific reasons behind uh, uh, capitalism that shapes the mindsets or the minds of Muslims. Uh, the question is, is capitalism a dominant concept or Muslims are not able to consider its uh, side effects uh, on the lives of Muslims. And the second reason is that, uh, as uh, we all know, Western, uh, Western knowledge has uh, a better practical, uh, 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 better practical, uh, better practices in today's world. And uh, as the era of uh, AI, artificial intelligence, it enhanced so much more. So what will be our uh, practical response or uh, through Islamic worldview, do we have any specific uh, practical response in order to shape the minds, uh, 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 to reshape the minds to Islamic economics and uh, the next generation start to follow Islamic economics and then practice is in their daily lives? Thank you. 
Yes, I discussed some of these solutions in my lecture. I said that basically it's all about spirituality. It's about ma'arifat. Learning to recognize Allah Ta'ala through the manifestations that we see. And this is something that artificial intelligence cannot do. So, uh, an artificial intelligence is really artificial in the sense that it is very impressive to non-experts. That is, um, if I ask about something that I don't know about, then um, the chatbot will produce answers based on what um, the leading experts are saying. But if you ask expert itself about that answer, he will say that this is very wrong and very deficient. Uh, this guy is just uh, copying the ideas which have been dominant in this field for a while, because that's what uh, chatbots does. It just collects opinions of people and it takes the majority and um, it, it reports them. It, it doesn't have any intelligence. So whenever you have an expert in a field, uh, he will be ahead of the AI. Now, some people think that this will change as AI gathers more uh, intelligence, but this is not true because every situation, basically AI is the use of experience. So now the problem is that the world is continuously changing. So now if I want to assess what will happen tomorrow, uh, because the situation today is completely unique, something like nothing like this has ever existed before. So it is intelligence which allows me to say that, okay, such and such experience is not relevant for the future because things have changed. And if you don't have the relevant expertise, then you won't understand that things have changed and you will continue to predict on the basis of the past and you will end up with wrong results. But anyway, um, this is a complex topic and I can't go very deep into this. All right, so, so any other questions? I'm, I'm looking at um, the chat. And so somebody is talking about Gandhian models. Yes, I think that the capitalism is especially toxic model because it kills the heart and the soul. It kills uh, our connection to environment and, and many other models of the Buddhist model and the Gandhian model, and even a Christian model are better and they provide some uh, the, some of the missing dimensions of the capitalist model. But Islam has its own complete worked out fiqh and um, a thousand centuries of ex experience. So nothing else can really match up to that. People can invent a uh, theory on their own. Like there is this um, donut economics. It's very good, but it's uh, invented by one person and uh, it will be very hard for it to gain traction. If we, if we, we can develop the same theory on the basis of Islamic principles of trusteeship, etc. cetera. Uh, somebody says, can I ask a question? Uh, so if you raise your hand, I will be able to see it and I will ask uh, you to, uh, uh, to ask. Uh, if you just, yes, okay, Daniel, please uh, ask a question. Yes, can we hear you? Yeah, Daniel? We can't uh, hear your voice, so anybody else has a question? Okay, Najib Ahmed. You mentioned oh. that uh, students students look at their lives uh, like they're selling their life. Uh, what's the alternative way to think about it? What's the the other yes. way? Yes, I have developed this at uh, 
in some of my other lectures, but our life is very brief. It's very precious. It's not about making money. Uh, um, it's about learning how to be the best that we can be. It's learning how to be a better person. And that is something which is not available by studying physics or chemistry or biology. How can I be become, Allah Ta'ala has put us down as a seed uh, which can grow into a human being. And uh, how do we become human beings? For that, we have to study the, um, uh, uh, the teachings of Islam uh, in many different dimensions. Somebody asked about the slides. Yes, I had meant to put up the slides for download, but uh, I did not do so yet. I will put up uh, put them up on slide share and share a link uh, via email later or also on my WhatsApp chat group. If you want to join the WhatsApp chat group, you can do so by going to my homepage, uh, going to my blog, Islamic Worldview blog, azprojects.wordpress.com and looking at the about uh, page, which has a link to the chat, uh, to the chat group. I am based in Islamabad. Uh, uh, Fuad Masood, can you ask a question? Hello? Yes, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Hello, Prof? Yes, I can uh, hear you. Okay. I would like to ask about uh, efficiency, the concept of efficiency in uh, capitalism. Because uh, now we uh, our mind is colonized by capitalism, so uh, everything must be measured by efficiency, like in Islamic banking, productivity, and so on. So uh, in my opinion, efficiency is only uh, good for mission, mission activity, not for uh, economic and social, uh, let alone for worship. Is it right? Uh, what do you... Someone. Yes, please. Thank you. I think that once you uh, that economic efficiency is very harmful because it doesn't take into account the social impact of your work. So from an Islamic perspective, we should look at the social benefits that are being produced by your business and compare them to the social costs. Uh, this is as opposed to the money profits and the money money costs, which is the current calculus. And this money cost and money benefit has produced enormous, uh, created enormous dam damage to mankind. So, um, yes, uh, Islamic accounting would be very different so, from uh, uh, monetary accounting okay. that is currently being taught. So, uh, it is uh, correct that uh, it's correctable for Islamic banking use uh, efficiency as a measure for productivity or for performance. Measure no, money. it's not, I not think, correct. Uh, this is why I think I, I'm concerned about this. But uh, efficiency actually only suitable for mission, mission, for machine, yeah? not for human activity. Yes. Thank you. Regarding this, I have, okay, um, I am putting down. Um, uh, one more question, Prof. Yes. Hello? Yes. Yes, uh, go ahead. Yeah, okay. I have uh, proposed for the concept of incommensurability. You know, uh, incommensurability, uh, it means that uh, rationality in Islamic based uh, worldview is different from rationality uh, based on capitalistic capitalism with you. So uh, if we use uh, the concept of rationality or mission, then will be misleading. So uh, in Islam, uh, aql, aql and uh, fikr is uh, different from reason and rationality. What do you think? Thank you. Oh, this is a very good question. Uh, basically, You see, when um, the West defined rationality, it defined it in a different way from what we think of as rationality. You see, they rejected religion as superstition, and they said it is not rational to believe in, in anything you cannot see. Right. So you start by saying that rationality is right. uh, rejects God and rejects afterlife and rejects judgment because you can't see them, so there's no evidence for them. 
So it's irrational to believe in things for which there is no evidence. So uh, you start with that rationality and then you say, okay, then it is rational to maximize pleasure on this earth because that's all we have. There is no life afterwards. So uh, then you say that, okay, there is no, uh, no God, so we can do whatever we like. So there is no morality. So anything which gives me more money is good. So all of this is rational. And that's how an economic theory works that, okay, you can make a promise and you can break this promise if it brings you more uh, benefits. So all of this is rational, but this is not rational according to Islam if we take into account the longer perspective that we are going to live, uh, that success will be determined on the day of judgment. And so if you want to succeed forever and have infinite pleasure from conception, then you better be um, uh, then, then you better obey the orders of Allah in this planet, on this earthly life. And this may not involve, uh, Allah says, Lan tana birra hatta mimma So it means that um, you should give away things that you love, things that will maximize your pleasure in order to, um, to, uh, to uh, in the okay, path thank of you. Allah. Uh, one more question, bro. So, Hello, one more question. All right. One more all right. Okay. Uh, if we compare uh, the concept of ethics and akhlaq, it's different because akhlaq means habu min Allah and habu min And ethic, I think, is not uh, only, I think, ethic only habu uh, min and the fundamental uh, concept is different from akhlaq. So, uh, I think it is better to use uh, the concept of akhlaq instead of ethics. What do you think? So as a Muslim, uh, we have to not to translate akhlaq into ethics because uh, akhlaq uh, consists of habul min Allah and habul min anas. We, uh, while uh, ethic is only habul min anas and it is uh, relative, relative because uh, habul min anas where? Uh, in United States or in China is different. Uh, whether it's good or bad or right or wrong. Thank you very much. Yes, yes, this is correct. There's a distinction between ethics. Basically, ethics is the rules of conduct. It's morality. And character is different. Characters, so anybody can follow rules even if they don't have akhlaq. But um, and especially you can create rules and you can make punishments and uh, rewards so that Everybody wants to follow the rules of ethics, but uh, what you want is an internal uh, character which, which desires to follow the rules because out of the love of Allah. So that's a different level. But so I think that we are reaching the end of the time. So I will take uh, one more question if there is one. Or we can just call it uh, uh, the end for okay, now. Sir, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Who is yes, that? So this is Daniel. Daniel, okay. Yes. Uh, sir, uh, I, I don't have a question. I have an observation which I want to, you know, put it in front of you. Lately, I did a massive research study. Uh, and uh, like, you know, in today's session, you were telling us some systemic aspects, how do they control our minds and, you know, why, how do they produce a specific kind of individuals? So in my research study, I was a bit interested in trying to understand the inside of the individual, why the individual is getting controlled and why, you know, he's susceptible to these kind of what you call manipulative, what you call activity done at the system level. So I, 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 I what I've seen in my research is this. I'll, I'll put these observations in front of you. First, humans uh, think in organizational terms, first. And second, I think that, you know, generally speaking, humans lack political agency. Now, what do I mean by organizational terms is this. I mean, for one day or two days or three days, I can stay hungry or I can starve. But the idea that, you know, I'll burn the field and, you know, the idea that, you know, in future I'll not get food is not acceptable for me. So the moment when we talk about some alternatives or some ideas which are contrary to the dominant ideas, I think individuals get, get into this mindset, okay, fine, you know, 
this is a destructive idea because it is, you know, taking us, taking away our, you know, sustenance away from us, first thing. And secondly, I mean, as far as ethics and morals are concerned, they would want their manager to, or they would want to have some good, what you call, or ethical aspects within their organization. But the idea that, you know, the organization should be transformed and, you know, created in a very different spirit or in a very different structure, this is not acceptable for them because they think that, you know, this is an idea which is a destructive idea, which is going to take away our sustenance away from us. So I'm just putting these observations in front of you, and I, I would love to have your comment. These are, I, I have, I have uh, you know, what you call, I've been able to find these problems as to why, you know, uh, we become vulnerable to these control activities. So I'd like to have your comment on this. Thank you very much, sir. Yes, well, of course, this is a very, very um, complex question. So let me just give a very simple, simplified answer that when you are trying to make changes, then there are three strategies, loyalty, voice, and exit. So when you are following the loyalty model that uh, you say that if I try to make change, this will cause uh, damage maybe to me, maybe to the corporation or whatever organization. And so out of loyalty, I will not express any criticism because that will strengthen. And then voice is that when you start to express your complaints and your problems in the hope that you can create internal reform. And finally, exit is when you see that there is so much uh, commitment to the organization that no one will listen to serious uh, proposals for reform. So you basically exit and you try to start um, change. So for, uh, and, and all three strategies are, are suitable for different situations. For example, for a while, I tried to work within the economy and I tried to show that, uh, look, the utility theory maximization model is wrong. And uh, that's very easy to prove. But uh, there was no response in the sense that people uh, uh, said that, yes, we know that it's wrong, but we will still continue to use it. So now there is no possibility for change. Ultimately, I realized that economics is a strong ideological commitment. It's a religion, not a science. And so um, it cannot be, you, you cannot, uh, so basically it's pointless to work on economists. And uh, so basically um, instead of any making an in-house revolution, now I am working on working on um, on uh, training the youth because the avenue, the leverage that we have comes from knowledge. Allah Ta'ala gave a very powerful knowledge which changed the world. And today we still have this knowledge. The, the knowledge that is being taught in economics all around the world is useless. It is useless in terms of understanding the world. And we can provide alternative ways of thinking and, and knowing about the world, which provide a lot more, lot deeper insights about how the world works and how we can work to change it. And this is not available in Western economics. So the power of knowledge is what will attract people to this. And this knowledge will have the power to change the world if we make the intention that we will use this for the benefit of the Ummah for the sake of the love of Allah. All right, so I think we, we can stop here and um, see you uh, first Sunday of next week. Meanwhile, if you're on my list, then you will receive weekly um, mailings. And also the best way to keep up with the course is via, um, uh, via the Al-Nafi website, which has, um, which has an online course in which I'm recording everything in sequence and uh, in um, all the, the course materials are available. All right. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. So we can stop now.